They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Hi there, thank you for joining me for this, the first in our message series entitled Being Church, in which we're going to look at and take inspiration from seven characteristics of the early church as recorded in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. It's a really exciting series, I'm looking forward to it. Today, by way of introduction, I want to roll back a few verses from those and look at an amazing moment that changed the course of human history which is a big claim, but it was a big moment. It was the moment when God poured out his Holy Spirit on and in the first believers so that they could be said to have been immersed in the Holy Spirit. In fact, they were baptised in the presence of God. A few weeks ago, you might recall, I spoke about the importance of Christians being baptised in water, immersed in water as a public sign of an inward transformation. What we read about in Acts chapter 2 is effectively a second baptism that is the privilege of every Christian believer to be baptised in the Holy Spirit as an outward sign of the indwelling of that same Holy Spirit. So without further ado, let's read the account as it's found in Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Well, this is an amazing thing. Uh, folks around them were bewildered, amazed, inquisitive, perplexed and confused, so much so that the Apostle Peter feels compelled to stand up and explain to a huge crowd what is going up. And so we pick up at verse 14 of chapter 2, where he says this. Peter stood up with the eleven apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, my fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. You need to clearly understand what's happening here. These people are not drunk like you think they are. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is the fulfillment of what was prophesied through the prophet Joel. For God says... This is what I will do in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on everybody and cause your sons and daughters to prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men will experience dreams from God. The Holy Spirit will come upon all my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I will reveal startling signs and wonders in the sky above and mighty miracles on the earth below. So he continued with this message and uh, the response was phenomenal. About 3,000 people in that crowd accepted his message, were baptised and added to what we know as the Christian church. And then we have described what they did as a community. And we will unpack those over the next seven weeks in this series, Being Church. What we can learn from the very first church that sets us up to be a life-giving church in the 21st century. But before we get into that detail, this morning I want to speak to one basic truth. Simply, here it is. A spirit-filled church is a church full of spirit-filled people. In other words, in order that our church, Harvest Church, uh, for it to be the church that God wants it to be, to be devoted, awestruck, united, generous, engaged, overflowing and growing, that's the seven things, we first must, each one of us, be filled with the Holy Spirit whether that be for the first time or for the 100th time. 
Paul the Apostle in Ephesians 5.18 asks us, begs us, orders us to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives as the engine room of all that we do. Think about a steam train. All those moving parts everywhere, wheels and cogs and pistons and all sorts. But without the fire in the firebox, there is no movement. Or think about an electric car. And the new ones are amazing, aren't they? Speed and acceleration, dazzling screens, etc., etc. But they can't do anything without the energy from the power cell being transmitted to every aspect of the car. You see, for us, we can read all the right books, we can listen to all the best podcasts, we can have everything in motion like the train or the car, but without the presence of the Holy Spirit deep inside us, we will not be able to be the church that God has planned us to be. By his presence, he transforms us day by day into the likeness of Jesus. He empowers us to do the works prepared in advance for us to do, and he enables us to impact our world. In one of my most treasured books, which I purchased in 1983, David Watson writes this, The spirit-filled disciples became the greatest spiritual revolution the world had ever seen. When the Spirit came upon them at Pentecost, which is what I was reading about, nothing could stop them. Despite threats, imprisonment, beatings and killings, their enraged opponents had to acknowledge that these timid, ordinary men and women had turned the world upside down. It was a stupendous missionary achievement, which probably has never been paralleled in the Christian church. Devoid of human resources, they were totally dependent on the power of the Spirit of God. Having the Holy Spirit in our lives is so incredibly wonderful and countless books and resources have been written about the benefits that he brings into our lives. But in our context today, as we step into autumn, I simply want to invite you to see this season as one in which our primary aim as individuals and together as Harvest Church is to invite and receive more of the presence of God in our lives and in our church. I'm inviting you to join me in inviting the Holy Spirit to fill you to overflowing day after day and week after week until a life of increase and breakthrough becomes our operational norm. Why do I think this is so important? Well, let me give you a couple of reasons. Firstly, I think that the simple pressures of life, the constant dripping tap of messaging all around can lead us to a mindset in which we become accustomed to decrease and stuckness, if that's a word, rather than increase and breakthrough. We so easily can be desensitized to what God wants to do in us and through us. Now, it's not necessarily a decision that we make, but an atmosphere that we inadvertently imbibe. Let me illustrate this for you. I remember a few years ago, I went paintballing uh, on an afternoon with one of my son's pre-wedding celebrations, uh, what became very clear is that no matter how much we hid ourselves behind obstacles, simply because we were in that fenced off paintballing area, we were getting covered in bright green paint that was getting fired from some guns. Some of those uh, paintballs, they hurt. Some of them just marked you and you didn't know. Now, it's not too much of a leap of thinking to realise that we exist in an environment today which can diminish us unless we are filled over and over by God's Spirit, in which the Holy Spirit establishes us in our place with Jesus as our overcomer. Jesus himself said this, In the world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. You and I were made for increase and breakthrough. Rather than being pushed down and stuck, our destiny is to see God move more and more in our lives and in the lives of those whom we pray or to whom we minister in Christ's name. Now, imagine for a moment that we had a couple of heart dials, like on a car dashboard, that could show us our level of increase and our level of breakthrough on the other one. So on the one dial, we have increase, at one end, we have, you know, on the dial, if you can imagine, it's 0 through 10. At one end, we have complete decrease. And at the other end, fully up, we have complete increase. Now, by increase, I mean 
that I have a living and vibrant expectation that God has more for me than I'm experiencing now. That what I'm experiencing now is at the very best, the beginning of what he has in store for me. Think back to those first disciples. Post-resurrection, they had met with the living Jesus. They had seen him alive after he had been dead. Then he says, there's more for you. There's an increase for you to receive. Wait here in Jerusalem and, quote, in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. This is an increase that they had no inkling about whatsoever. They could never have imagined what it would be like. Now I imagine that as Jesus issued that invitation, their increased dial was going up, up, up. What had been decreased by all the trauma of the past six weeks was on the turn. What about you? Where would you say you are right now? Where is your increased dial when you think of your level of faith for increase? Some of you are right away saying, uh, that's easy, it's absolutely on flat. This season has diminished my expectation nearly to zero. Frankly, I'm just trying to get through. Some of you are, yeah, well, it's been higher, but I do believe God is at work. Still others are, yep, it's high, it's bouncing off the top pin. I'm really believing for increase in this next season, that God has more for me. What about your breakthrough dial, the other one? This is the one that at lowest is stuckness. Through to, right on the number 10 if you like, breakthrough. Are you feeling stuck in thinking that's holding you back? Stuck in a situation that just doesn't seem to want to change? Have you got illness that just will not shift? Fears that constantly rise to the surface? Financial or relational worries that are a big weight? Or are you feeling stuck with the baggage from the past that is getting heavier by the day and it's stopping you from moving forward? All of those things act to hold us back from the breakthrough that God wants from us. That's cheery, isn't it? <laughs> well, let me illustrate some movement. I saw this funny video on YouTube a while back that showed some boys playing a prank on their friend. They were out hill walking, a bunch of them, uh, the whole caboodle, the backpacks, the tents, the little metal cups fastened on the side of the rucksack. But every time they stopped for a rest, the so-called friends would get a rock and slip it into the backpack of this one friend. Now, by the time they got at the end of the day to the end of their long hike, the poor guy was exhausted. He didn't know why. It was only when he went to get his tent out that he found all the rocks. They had been adding to his burden without realising and held him back. But what about imagining breakthrough in those same areas that those rocks could be lifted? Imagine if God changed your situation or the situation of the people that you love, changed the thinking that's holding you back, brought change to the situation that just does not want to seem to change, ministered healing to illness and disease, placated your rising fears with overwhelming peace, lifted financial and relational worries by breaking through in stewardship, provision, forgiveness and reconciliation. What if he lifted the baggage, took out the rocks and freed you from your past? Wow, that's breakthrough. So what about your dials? Where are they? Increase? Breakthrough? Any room for growth? As I've been preparing for today, the Lord has so convinced me that we should be praying for more and expecting more. Not because we are selfish or greedy, but because we want to be released into all that God has got planned for us. Because we want to spiritually run where up to now we can barely walk. I'm convinced that God wants to invite us to a Pentecost moment whereby the outpouring of his Holy Spirit right now for increase and breakthrough in our lives and in the lives of those that we love and pray for. I believe he wants to recalibrate all of our dials so that what we thought was 9 out of 10, which was wonderful, actually becomes 5 and subsequently there's even more room for growth. That's what happened at Pentecost 1. They had no idea what was coming their way. They waited, they positioned themselves for the presence of God, and then he poured himself out and into their lives. How about that? Whatever your dials are, 
How about joining me in believing that there's room for growth? Would you join me in believing that the promise of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 is for you and me today and in this season? Let me read it to you. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all that he has planned. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. Today, our loving Heavenly Father wants to bless our lives so much that he promises to give his Holy Spirit to those who ask for it. Jesus said this, Dads, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you, sinful people, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So, will you join me today in asking for a fresh outpouring of His Spirit? Like the first disciples, we position ourselves for His presence and then invite His presence to become intensely personal. Now, if you're not yet a Christian, you can join in this prayer, but you need to ask God to show Himself to you, acknowledge your need of Him, Stop trying to solve things in your own strength and invite God into your life. So let's pray. Holy Spirit of God, we invite you to come and to fill us afresh. To come and build in us a sense of increase and a sense of breakthrough. That there would be movement in our lives that we would know by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit that tomorrow is going to be different from today and next week will be different from this and that you are leading us to a place of tremendous fulfillment in your presence. So bless us to that end we ask. Amen. So there you have it. This is a new season, a season of increase and breakthrough. This is the foundational movement for our next few weeks. Next week, would you join me as we begin to unfold the church as God intended it to be by looking at Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. You might want to read it in advance of next week. So until then, peace and grace to you.